Okay, would everybody come back in? We're ready to continue on with our service. If you're out in the lobby, come on in. Boy, it got real quiet in here. A few, so just a, everybody's waiting with expectation. Can we welcome back my good friend, Greg Silverman? He's going to minister to us. Open the floodgates of heaven, pour out such a blessing. Pour out your love, open the floodgates of heaven, and send forth your spirit. Send forth your love, pour out your love. The clouds of heaven are full, they are heavy, about to pour on thankful hearts, we are devoted to being thankful, so let the flood of the blessing start, pour out your love into our hearts by the Holy Pour out your love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. Open in the floodgates of heaven and pour out such a blessing. Pour out your love, rope in the floodgates of heaven and send forth your spirit. Your love, pour out your love. For he will come like a rushing flood that the breath of the Lord drives. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Let his heaven in faith. This man has got soul, I'll tell you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Yamod yeah, Weston Jones.
Baruch Hu et Adonai Hamvorach. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Leolam Vahed. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Leolam Vahed. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam. Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Ha'amim. Venatan Lanu et Torato. Baruch Ata Adonai, no tain Torah. Amen. Blessed be the Lord who is to be blessed. Blessed be the Lord who is to be blessed forever and ever. Blessed be the Lord who is to be blessed forever and ever. Blessed art you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all people and has given us your Torah. Blessed art you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. Today's reading is from the book of Daniel. Chapter 9, we'll be reading from 15 through 23. And this is Daniel's prayer. This is in the first year of the reign of Darsus, who is the son of Xerxes. Daniel understands Jerusalem's going to be desolate for 70 years. And this is his plea to God. And we're going to pick it up in verse 15. Now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned. We have done wrong. O Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our fathers have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, O Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests for you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, listen. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, hear and act for your sake. O oh my God, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in an earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began your prayer, an answer was given, which I have come to tell you. For you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech olam Asher natan lanu Torah emed V'chaye olam nata bitochenu Baruch ata Adonai, no tain ha-Torah. Amen. Blessed art you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the law of truth and has planted everlasting life in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. Well, I'm really looking forward to getting into today's lesson, uh, three-part series on Messianic prophecy. What is Messianic prophecy? Messianic prophecy is prophecy that talks specifically about the coming of the Messiah. Uh, coming from a Jewish background, the question is, how are we going to recognize the Messiah when he comes? Because the majority of Jewish people today don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. But is he? Well, obviously, I think he is. So why do some of us think he is and some of us think he's not? What Messianic prophecy will do for us is show us what the Bible says the coming Messiah would be like, what he would do. 
specifically when he'd be born, where he would be born, how he would, he would be born, what he would do, and how the people would react to him. It's all written in the scripture, which for them was all in their future. So over the next few weeks, we're going to look at what the Jewish Bible says about the coming of the Messiah, and then you can decide for yourself who the Messiah is. You already know the position I've taken. But before I talk about specific messianic prophecy, and I've been giving this a lot of thought, and I, I hope I can communicate it right, but you've got to understand that our intellect is only a fraction of why we believe what we believe as people. I can sit there and convince you that all the messianic prophecies mean exactly this, but that doesn't mean you're going to agree with me. Even if I have ironclad arguments, doesn't mean you're going to agree with me. Doesn't mean you're going to become a follower of Yeshua, the Messiah. So what does it take for us to make a decision? Intellect, emotion, and will. I'm not so good with helping you with your will. God's not that good at helping you with your will. That's up to you. That's a, a struggle you're going to have to have in your own nefesh. Emotion can be very useful. Emotions aren't bad. They can be very useful, but sometimes they're a little unreliable. But it is important to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and strength. So why do some Jewish people believe Jesus, Yeshua, is the Messiah, and most don't? Is it intellectual? I don't think it is. What I'm going to share with you this morning is intellectual, and intellect is important. But I don't think it's intellectual. I don't think that's the main hang-up. Well, what is it? Well, it's emotional. And I don't mean to say emotions are insignificant. I told you they are important. They can, they can drive a person's life and decision-making. And by emotion, sometimes I mean the way you feel, but it's deeper than that. Um, silly illustration, but I'll take a silly one and then a more serious one. Let's say you're a 49ers fan. It doesn't seem to matter to you that they never win. You're still a diehard 49ers fan. And somebody can come up to you and show you the stats of the Steelers and how they're so much better. Now you're going to become a Steelers fan? No. You eat, breathe, bleed 49ers. And it doesn't matter how bad the team is, you're going to be their fans. Why? I don't know. Maybe, it was an, maybe you were a fan since childhood and you love them and you're just going to hold on to them. Maybe your great-great-uncle played on the team. Maybe you're from their town. I don't know why. But it's not intellectual. Jewish people are raised to believe that Jesus is not the Messiah. And to come to believe that he is, to say that he is, we feel like it's betraying our people. That's not intellectual. That's, I don't want to do what my people say is wrong to do. That's emotional. My mom, my dad, were they all wrong? Again, that's irrelevant, but it's emotional. Most people who are born Catholic die Catholic. That has nothing to do with the rightness or wrongness of their doctrine. Most people who are born Muslim die Muslim. It's got nothing to do with the rightness or the wrongness of their doctrine. Most people were born Jewish, die Jewish. It's got nothing to do with the rightness or the wrongness of their doctrine. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? And as hard as it is for us to deal with our emotions, we have to. We have to let our intellect guide our hearts and not allow our heart to guide our intellect. Emotions can be fuzzy. Hopefully your intellect's not, but you never know. Oftentimes the emotions mess with the head, too. And it's not just with religious matters. Political matters, financial matters, it's all the same. You've got to let your intellect guide your emotions and not vice versa. So Christians believe Jesus is the Messiah. Most Jewish people don't. Some do. Why do most Jewish people don't? You ever wonder why Jewish people don't believe he's the Messiah and Christians do? Why do a bunch of Gentiles believe a Jewish guy is the Messiah and a bunch of Jewish people don't? That's kind of interesting. It's not an easy answer. But let me help you understand the issues. Most of you have wrestled with them, but maybe you've never just looked at them. 
And they're multifaceted. There's many issues. There's the intellectual piece, and we'll be dealing with that. There's the emotional piece that deals with history, anti-Semitism, tradition. Let me talk to you about anti-Semitism for a moment. The primary persecutors of Jewish people in the last 2,000 years were groups identified themselves as the church. The Catholic Church in most of the world and the Orthodox Church up in Russia and those, that part of the world. These people claim to follow and worship Jesus Christ and they kill and persecute Jews. So it's no wonder that Jewish people aren't too interested in Jesus. Because the idea is, if that's what Jesus is like, I don't want to have anything to do with him. But that's not what Jesus is like. Jesus never told people to do that. Boy, would they freak out if they learned Yeshua is actually Jewish. They wouldn't know that. But he is. I don't say was. Is. I saw this cool article in uh, Israel Today. It's just the latest issue. Former neo-Nazi finds out he has Jewish roots, becomes Orthodox Jew. <laughs> wow. True story. This guy went from hassling and persecuting and hating to being an observant Jew. Was that intellectual or emotional? So, if all these people, in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, persecute Jewish people, it's no wonder part of our communal psyche is against Yeshua. It's a knee-jerk reaction without researching the name of Yeshua. Yeshua would have never approved of that nonsense. Those aren't true followers of Yeshua at all. But how can the typical Jewish person know that? All we know is that we're getting beat up and killed in the name of their God, so we don't want to have anything to do with them. That's part of the reason right there. I already alluded to the traditional reason. You know, it's become a, a, just a matter of course. Jewish people don't believe in Jesus, and if you believe in Jesus, you're no longer Jewish. It was funny. Uh, <laughs> I've told this story more than once, but it, it just gives you an idea of the difference between the intellect and the emotional side of this issue. I remember when I was a, a lot younger, a nice elderly Jewish woman coming up, grabbing my cheeks and saying, you got such a Yiddish apunim, such a Jewish face you have. I do. I stand out. I'm stereotypically Jewish. Then we talked for a bit, and she found out I believed in Jesus. And she said, you're no longer Jewish. <laughs> like, what do I look like now? <laughs> so you see, initially, her idea of Jewishness was ethnic. But then, when she got offended with my beliefs, she wanted to exclude me from Jewish. Well, lady... You know, you can get offended at me, but my DNA hasn't changed a bit. And, and you know me. It's more than DNA. I believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I worship him. I believe in the promises of the Bible. I don't care if you think I'm Jewish or not. It's irrelevant what you think. It's what God thinks that matters. I am Jewish. Now, you, do you worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? I don't care if you eat bagels and locks every day of the week. Do you walk with God? then you're not Jewish if you don't. See, it's intellectual, it's emotional, it's traditional, it's a multifaceted discussion. So, I'm going to share with you prophecy this morning. It is the intellectual piece. It is a necessary piece. But it's not the only piece. I don't want you to ever hesitate sharing the message of Yeshua with somebody. How do we get through all that other stuff? I don't know. It's not my yab. You know what my job is? Praise him. Like Greg saying this morning, let God deal with God's stuff. You deal with your stuff. Pray for these people that their hearts would be softened to truth even if it's uncomfortable, that their minds would be open to the spirit of God. Pray and then let God do his work. The Bible, the Jewish Bible, the Christian Bible, the Bible is the only book on the planet that is loaded with demonstratedly, demonstrably proven prophecy. This is a book like no other. So what we're looking at this morning, even though some of you are used to it, should blow people's minds. You know, there's a lot of phony prophets out there. So how do you know a true prophet from a false prophet? Well, there's a few ways. What they teach, and if what they say doesn't come to pass. Let me show you something. I've got a video clip I'd like you to see. Let's, let's take a look at that. 
It would be a worldwide earthquake such as man has never seen. Destruction and death everywhere. They spent months warning the world of the apocalypse. On May 21st at 6 p.m., this man, Harold Camping, says worldwide destruction would begin. His message sent far and wide via broadcast from his small California studio. And predicting the end of the world didn't come cheap. Camping and his followers spent millions on advertising like the one on this billboard. There's just no reason in the world, no possibility that it will not happen. But 6 o'clock came and went. Although Iceland's most active volcano did start to erupt, there was no apocalypse. I looked at all the scientific data I could find, like carbon-14 dating or potassium-argon dating. The 89-year-old camping had said some 200 million people would be saved. And those left behind would slowly die until finally the globe is consumed by a fireball on October 21st. When they shall see the smoke of her burning. It's not the first time this retired civil engineer has predicted the world would end. He said the same thing would happen in 1994. He was wrong that time, he says, because of a mathematical error. Nicole Grether, The Associated Press. Nicole Grether, The Associated Press. These people, somebody needs to smack them upside the head with a rock. <laughs> Figuratively speaking, of course. But see, the penalty for prophesying falsely in the Old Testament was stoning. Unfortunately, oftentimes, people will hear things like this, and they'll say, oh, you're just all a bunch of kooks. How can you listen to the Bible? He says this, she says that. How do you know the truth? Well, for starters, read the book. Don't worry about what he says or she says. It's funny. Back to intellect. Because counterfeit bills exist, does that mean we stop using real bills? No. Because there's phony medicine out there, voodoo and hoodoo, does that mean we start, stop using real medicine? No. Because there's bad religion out there and false doctrine, does that mean we should avoid the true stuff? No. So don't let these people scare you off from a hunt for the truth. Dive in deeply. Listen to Deuteronomy 18 from the Torah. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message that the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. The Bible says, hey, if it ain't true, don't believe it and don't listen to those guys. But the Bible is true. And so we're going to look at some of the Bible's prophecies. How to identify the Messiah, when he would be born, where he would be born, how he would be born, what he would do, and how people would react to him. Starting at the beginning, where would he be born? Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. According to the prophet Micah, the Messiah would come from Bethlehem. Now, perhaps you're saying, Steve, I didn't see the word Bethlehem in there. I mean, the word Messiah in there. No, you didn't. But nobody disputes it. This is what Jewish thought is. The Messiah would come from Bethlehem. Listen to an ancient commentary slash paraphrase of the Bible called Targum Jonathan, also known as the Jerusalem Targum. Quote, Out of you, Bethlehem, shall Messiah go forth before me to exercise dominion over Israel, whose name has been spoken from of old from the day of eternity. It is standard Jewish thought that the Messiah would come out of Bethlehem. Well, that narrows our hunt down. If the Messiah claims to be from anywhere else, he ain't the Messiah. I don't know why a bunch of people thought Schneerson was the Messiah. He's from New York. <laughs> it was interesting, while I was putting this lesson together, there was some big archaeological breaking news about Bethlehem. Now, how awesome is that? You say, Steve, there's archaeological news all the time. Yes, there is, but not about Bethlehem. In fact, this was the first. Let me read to you a segment of the article. Dated May 23rd of this year. Israeli archaeologists digging near the city of Jerusalem have discovered an ancient clay bulla about 2,700 years old bearing the name of Bethlehem. 
The artifact is the only known ancient reference to the city of Yeshua's birth, Jesus' birth, found outside the Bible, experts said. A bulla is a piece of clay used to make an impression in wax, sealing a document. Why do they have to call it a bullet? It's a seal. That's what it is. The bulla has three lines of text. The first says, in the seventh. The second says, Bethlehem. And the third has the letter CH, which was probably the last letter of Melech, the word for king. It seems that in the seventh year of the reign of a king, it's unclear if it was referring to Hezekiah, Manasseh, or Josiah. This would give us contemporary to the time of Micah, whose prophecy we're reading, so this is just way cool. A shipment was dispatched from Bethlehem to the king in Jerusalem. This is the first time the name Bethlehem appears outside the Bible in an inscription from the first temple period, which proves that Bethlehem was indeed a city in the kingdom of Judah. It proves it? The Bible proves it. It's already been proved, but I still appreciate the archaeological discovery. It's way cool. The Messiah had to come from Bethlehem because he had to be a descendant of King David, and King David's family is all from Bethlehem. So the scriptures laid it out. The Messiah would be a descendant of Israel's greatest king, David, and he would not only be from David's line, he would be from David's hometown. He will be born in Bethlehem. That's what the Jewish prophet said. But there's an, another ancient Jewish document. I already read to you from Targum Jonathan. Let me read to you from another ancient Jewish document. It's called the New Testament. Oh, that's not an ancient Jewish document. Uh, yes, it is. It's about 2,000 years old, and it was written by Jewish people about Jewish things. And this piece, in, piece was probably written in Israel by a man who witnessed many of the events in his book. Here's what it says. After Yeshua was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. And they asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? What do the prophets say? And here was the answer. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. I can tell you this. The Messiah is coming from Bethlehem. I only know of one person in all of human history who people think is the Messiah who came from Bethlehem. But it gets even narrower. You know, a lot of people were born in Bethlehem, and Bethlehem's been there for a long time. You can visit Bethlehem today. It's still a city. Unfortunately, it's not in Ju Israel proper, but it's still a city. So how can we narrow it down just a little more? This is just stunning to me. The Bible doesn't only say he will be born in Bethlehem. It says when he'll come. Let me read to you. Weston set the stage for us earlier when he read the first portion of Daniel. The angel Gabriel was sent to talk to Daniel, or one of the angels. He ran into some trouble. The message comes to him, and this is the message. Know and understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, Moshiach, Messiah, until the Messiah, the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one, the Messiah, will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, like a lot of prophecy, and we'll get into this in the coming weeks, why prophecy is so confusing. This prophecy could have been a lot clearer. 62 sevens, 69 sevens, seven sevens. What? Okay, we know the Messiah is going to come. 
We know Jerusalem's going to be rebuilt, but what's with all the dates? Well, I'm going to give you the simple and the more complex. First, the simple. It says the Messiah will come and be cut off. And after that, the sanctuary would be destroyed. So this, for, for those of you like me, who are simple, the Jewish Bible says this, the Messiah will come and die before the temple's destroyed. That's without any weird interpretation. That's just what it says. Well, the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. So the Messiah must have come before 70 A.D. So here's what we've got. The Messiah will be born in Bethlehem before 70 A.D. Got any idea? Any, anybody come to mind? <laughs> That's the simple interpretation for those of you who are like me. But I had to research the more complex interpretation. And there's different ca calculations and ways that people do this. But they all come up with pretty much the same thing. Let me give you the more complex interpretation. No one understand, let me reread verse 25. No one understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, so we know it's between the destruction of the Jerusalem and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. It was destroyed in 586 B.C., and we know when it was rebuilt. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the Messiah, comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. Okay, if you do seven sevens, that's 62 sevens, plus seven sevens, you get a total of 69 sevens. You get seven sevens and 62 sevens equals 69 sevens. It worked on my calculator. There will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. So I just put seven sevens, that's 49 plus 62 came out, 69 times seven, then it's carry the one, carry the two. Number eight came out to 483 sevens. But what's a seven? Well, a seven could be a week. It could be uh, seven months. It's Shavuot, it's sevens. Shavuim. It could be sevens, sevens of years. Well, if it's weeks, nothing happened after 483 weeks. If it's months, nothing happened at 483 months. But something amazing happened after 483 years. Before I tell you what happened, notice it says, from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, the clock will start. That decree is recorded historically a couple times in the Bible. Here's the one I prefer. Nehemiah chapter 2. And we just looked at Nehemiah a couple months ago. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I, this is Nehemiah writing, took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed with fire? The king said to me, what do you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven. And I answered the king, if it pleases the king, if your servant has found favor in your sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? And it pleased the king to send me. So I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, May I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah? And may I have a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, so he'll give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy? And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my requests. And by the way, he did a, a, a lot more for him too. And he went back and he rebuilt the walls. And the city was rebuilt. The Persian king Artaxerxes, 
the one referenced in this passage, issued his decree 445 B.C. There's very little debate about that, maybe a year or two. There's no significant debate over that. 445 B.C. So remember, we've got 69, year, 69 sevens times seven sevens, which equals 483 sevens, years. If you take the year 40, 45 B.C. and then start counting years till you hit 483 years, that puts us at the year 38 A.D. But then you adjust it for the Jewish calendar for the leap years and such, and that puts you at 32 A.D. So Robert Anderson even calculated it to the very day that Yeshua entered Jerusalem riding on the donkey when crowds of people were throwing down palm branches calling him the Messiah. If the thing the prophet says doesn't come to pass, do not fear him. But what if it does? Then the implication is you better listen. Now, as we study the Messianic prophecies, I want to give you some of the rabbinic responses to some of these passages. You know, I'm a Messianic leader. I think this refers to Yeshua. I just showed you why. But what does the typical rabbi say? Well, let me read to you a Talmudic response. Let's say you're a Jewish person curious about the claims of Yeshua. And I've pointed out to you, Daniel chapter 9, you want to go study it. Dear Talmud, what should I do with this passage of Scripture? Here's what the Talmud would tell you. Rabbi Samuel ben Nachmani said in the name of Rabbi Jonathan, Blasted be the bones of those who calculate the end. For they would say, since the predestined time has arrived, and yet he has not come, he will never come. Did you hear what I just said? Cursed is the person who researches this. Because if they do, they're going to find out the time determined has already passed. And they'll lose their faith. In other words, close your eyes and go like this. Because it obviously points to Yeshua and we're not going to believe in him. So don't even look at the passage. That's how they deal with it. I told you, it's not always intellectual. It's often emotional. So here's how you deal with it. Don't look at it. Don't study it. In fact, I pronounce a curse on you if you do. I'm not afraid of your curse. I got me a real prophet and a real God, and I'm not worried. They would say, since the predetermined time has arrived. Yes, it has. It happened around 32, 33 AD when the Messiah came, died for our sins, and rose again. Yeshua was born in Bethlehem. Everybody knows it. He died for our sins right at the time the prophet said he would. But not everybody knows that. But now you do. I told you, I'm okay with the intellectual part. But I don't know what to do with the volitional part. I don't know what to do with the emotional part. That's a struggle. And I understand it is. But it's definitely a struggle worth having. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, I believe in Yeshua. And I know that you sent him as the Savior for the world, for Jews and Gentiles alike to believe in. And yet so many of my people don't know for many, it's willful. For some, it's not. Even our leaders are pushing it away, telling us not to look, not to study, not to see. But Lord, you're bigger than our leaders. And your prophets are bigger than the prophets who lie. And so I pray that word would go out. For Tucson, we pray for our 300. For everywhere this message goes. May the name of Messiah be lifted up and the name of God be praised. The God 
who fulfills prophecy, who promises and then makes it come to pass. Lord God, open our hearts and open our minds that we might be the faithful of Israel for Messiah's sake. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. singing this final worship song together.
so worthy to be praised. Well, as, as our custom is, before we dismiss you, we'd like to send you with a blessing. Those of you at home, those of you here, please bow your heads for the ironic benediction. Yisarunai panavalecho v'yoseim lecho shalom. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Shabbat shalom, everybody.